Consuming Europe, what follows is going to be a meditation on three interlinked terms, consumption, credit and commerce. Together they have a nice cascading capitalist, almost rhyming feel to them. But other than that, they also, I think, provide us, or they also act as useful tools for prying open some of the topics, some of the issues at hand here today uh, under the heading of the consumption of Europe. It is fashionable, popular and attractive and often convenient to talk about the European idea, as if that idea was a single solitary unit of thought, a single point of light, um, a single destination. In fact, Europe, in its very nature, political and philosophical, is and has always been an amalgamation of two ideas, at least. The very idea of Europe always already contains in it a tension that requires, presupposes, the existence in it of more than a single idea. So in a sense, Europe, although it is one, is also two. There is diversity and there is unity, but you cannot have unity without diversity. So more, you could say, is simply more in Europe, for Europe. Talk of a single European idea is not necessarily wrong, but it is misguided in an important way. It is one-sided. It elevates above others one part of a complex reality which works not on, 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 on autopilot, as it were, but it works on debate, it works on tension, it works on the contribution of many more than one, more than a single node uh, uh, of information, debate, so on and so forth. Now, in a sense, we're entering, um, or to explain this perhaps, I think, we should enter, we must enter what, what I would call Derrida territory after the um, French philosopher now sadly passed away who wrote a book called L'autre cap, uh, in English, the other heading, meditating on just these themes, on what it means to be European. And his famous claim is, uh, and this is what provides this part, uh, or sustenance to this part of this talk, is that to be European means not to be identical with oneself, that it means always to have more than one heading. It means you must always have your own heading and then another one or more than one outside, something else by which really to orientate yourself, to get a measure of yourself, or in European terms, by which to get a measure of Europe. Um, the very idea of criticism underlying all of our reality here today, political, economic, scientific, all of these discourses, the idea of criticism stems from this as well as that of, a, of, of any rational dynamic of, of change uh, or the idea, idea of improvement. Obviously these uh, conceptions, these ideas are older than Derrida, they go back to Plato, the Platonic territory. It, it was Plato who put standards, ideals outside our everyday reality, uh, put them on a higher plane, uh, in a position above this world, um, something, to, something to be aspired to. Now this is a fairly static picture. Dynamism was obviously added to this by Christianity, which introduced the idea of redemption and more relevantly to us, that of progress, that it makes sense to aspire to that other reality, that that tension, that that gap between these two headings, or even more, that that, that, that gap can be crossed and it makes sense to try and cross it. Well, obviously, we now get to Immanuel Kant, the, I think you could, we could um, 
um, tolerably argue, the um, real founder of our today's idea of Europe as we know it, um, who provided a non-religious uh, logic, teleology, um, to this. Um, uh, key to this, to the whole European idea, the idea of um, uh, difference, to quote another Derridean word, is this disjunction, uh, the non-identity between the real and the ideal. This is the ground of the European political idea. This is the idea that sees it as obvious that Europe must always be formed by debate, that its course cannot be predetermined, that debate is what provides us with truth and that truth is a function of um, public reason, again to quote um, other philosophers, notably John Rawls, that debate, pluralism, the pluralism of views and viewpoints, opinions and desires is a good thing, is a necessary thing. Now, what emerges from this, this debate in a stable political setting is a certain type of credit, um, a term nicely echoing the Latin word credo, um, designating belief. Um, the credit that emanates from free, common, public exchange of views and truths is something that largely rests upon belief. Uh, it rests upon um, legitimacy granted to it by people who um, trust in the workings of, the, um, of their political environment, of the economic environment, of the social environment, who trust in the stability of all this. Now this is one way of describing what the European Union has been, how it has functioned over the past five, six, seven decades, and how it, I, I, I assume, how we um, believe, how we need to believe it will function in the future. Now this credit, the term credit here, um, is closely linked to another term, as I, was, as I was pointing out earlier, that of consumption, the kind of other side of the coin here. This credit is constantly being consumed, and that is a natural um, process under normal circumstances, the credit consumed just means that it changes form. Certain truths that were obvious a year ago, ten years ago, get superseded, they get replaced by others. That's the normal process in the European Union as well. What this current crisis, though, has seemed to do is it has started eroding that, credit, that, that, that European credit on a permanent basis. Um, the, the capitalist idiom has started working in a sort of different way. It has started working in a dominant way that started subsuming other idioms that normally in a free world are not part of the uh, economic sphere of discourse, economic kinds of thinking. But here in the European Union today, I think we can see a very uh, visible, um, very visible um, invasion of other idioms, other discourses by that of economics. Uh, and I think this has some very profound implications for the way the European Union is already functioning today and will and can function tomorrow and in the coming decades. Um, we see crisscrossing tensions across the entire European, uh, across the entire fabric of the European Union, its structures, um, its institutions. Uh, above all, we see the economic invading the political sphere. Uh, we look at the debate, the public debate today. We look, we, we look, we look, we look at, the, at the debate over the past three, four, five years. Um, the grounding principles are economic. They've become economic very suddenly and quite surreptitiously, and they're always explained away, that change's always been explained away by the presence of the crisis. But I think, again, this change is arguably here to stay, or at the very least, 
it is very difficult to see mechanisms that would take the economic out of the political again if times were ever to return to the kind of normality that was taken uh, as a given prior to, say, um, uh, 2009, uh, the, um, the, the Treaty of Lisbon. Um, now, the invasion of the economic in the political uh, goes, a lot deep, goes a lot deeper than simply affecting the way politics is conducted in the European Union. Uh, it's begun affecting democracy, the way popular legitimacy is generated and works in the European Union. It's brought the criterion, economic criterion of efficiency to the democratic proceedings, um, especially in the weaker countries. We, can, we only need to look at the technocratic governments that were at separate different times erected in countries like Italy and Greece um, to see how democratic legitimacy has in various um, ways, in various cases, at various times, lost out to a simple, simple and external dictate of efficiency, e efficiency um, and also one of austerity. Um, together with associated ideas, ideas associated with democracy and, 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 and the generation of legitimacy, above all that of debate, um, and with it also popular sovereignty. We, we see similar phenomena uh, affecting richer countries um, in almost, well, not in, in, in mirroring ways, but in, uh, in almost mirroring ways. Take the UK, take the Nordic countries, take Germany. We see how solidarity Another result of a long European conversation that's generated solidarity as a kind of credit, shared credit. We see how, how solidarity has become, um, or has fallen victim to terms, to notions such as affordability. It's become unaffordable. Obviously there's an element, a stronger element in that debate um, of popular sovereignty. It is the populations back that back up the politicians who make decisions uh, affecting the well-being of the southern countries. These decisions usually do not contribute to that well-being to, 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 to any noticeable degree. But again, it is the economic, the logic of the economy that ultimately uh, guides democratic debate in the north as well. Uh, there's, a, there's any number of um, a smaller um, smaller um, or smaller types of fallout of this change. You could, in a sense, um, perhaps one that deserves mentioning here is that of Cyprus, where the economic and the political intersected in a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a strategic level, you could say. Um, there was a point at which Cyprus came very close to being thrown out of the European Union over its inability, or of the Eurozone, sorry, um, on account of its inability to generate or find some 10 billion euros uh, and the meetings uh, at the European uh, level, at the EU level that dealt with the contingency uh, were solely and purely the meetings of finance ministers, of, of, of economic experts. Uh, there were no foreign ministers meetings, there was not even a summit um, that took up this issue and discussed it on a strategic level. Cyprus is leaving the Eurozone would have obviously had huge strategic implications for the European Union, would have had uh, huge implications for its uh, strategic common wheel, its um, common security and prosperity. But the mechanisms which would have made it an issue at the European level were missing. They had, I would argue, already fallen victim to this domination, the dominance of the economic idiom, it, there wasn't anyone to ask the political question. It didn't occur to anyone, it seemed. Another sign, another very dangerous sign, I think, of the dominance of the economic. Another sphere that the economic uh, is increasingly invading, so almost pushing out of debate, is the moral. That's obvi the obvious subtext, the, uh, the, 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 the undercurrents of uh, the political debate. What is moral for European citizens to do and what is moral, what is not moral for a European citizen to do, a European government, European politician. Uh, there's an obvious split here emerging between 
uh, a greater split than before between the national roles of politicians and European roles, and also discourse and uh, that be, uh, split be, a gap between European discourse and national discourse. Um, reading, um, reading or listening to the speeches of uh, José Manuel Barroso, the um, president of the Europe, European Commission, one can, I think, increasingly legitimately ask what uh, bearing they have upon our day-to-day uh, -day reality as citizens of uh, various member states. But a little bit, um, I'll, I'll be speaking more on this a little bit later. Um, now what the effect of all of this, political, philosophically, and even properly philosophically speaking, is that it deflates these creative tensions that, has, that have made Europe, or that these have made it move over not just decades, but centuries and even thousands of years, that these category uh, invasions stunt debate. Um, there's a technocratic edge to this, um, a certain, again, link up with the term, with the concept of technology in almost a, a Heideggerian way, uh, if, if that reference is permitted um, uh, within this talk. Um, technology, technocracy, um, is silent. It doesn't speak in a very fundamental sense that it doesn't also listen. There's nothing there to listen. It doesn't have sentience, political, moral, social, or intelligent. It simply demands submission. It, knows, it always knows better. It forms. Um, it asks to conduct all of human and humanity's business via itself without uh, debate without question, without criticism. Um, we only need to look at um, things like I don't know Facebook, what it does to friendship, uh, Instagram, what it does to images, beauty, cars, what what they do to transport. And similarly, I would argue, the logic of the economic is wreaking uh, comparable havoc. It's causing comparable damage to the fabric of Europe, the European fabric as we know it, and as I believe we would like to continue knowing it in the coming decades. Now all of this, as I was trying to say earlier, has an organic link to the idea of consumption. That credit, that European credit that's accumulated over the years is being consumed, is being wasted away by this onslaught of the economic. Um, Consumption here obviously has a double-edged uh, meaning. It means on the one hand to use, but also to use up, and on the other hand, it means to waste away. you consumed by illness. Being consumed by something is usually not the sustainable state of affairs. Now the European credit, this is my argument, is being consumed by the crisis, and there's no clear, there's no source actually in sight of of, of, for replenishment of that credit. At, on a little less abstract level, um, you could also say that the economic technocratic mindset now prevalent in Europe is consuming politics as such. It's, um, we, I talked about this um, under the examples of Greece and Italy. It's expropriating the sub-functions of politics, those of democracy, legitimacy, generation, debate, also, the city, also citizens' self-actualization, uh, self-determination as citizens of uh, democracies. It's affecting things as distant from it as ecology. The imperative of savings, uh, for example, is, I think, the predominant reason behind the demise of the Kyoto strategy. There's no area of European life that seems to be untouched by that um, economic encroachment. Uh, there's no area in which debate has not given way to the domination of economic, uh, of a te technocracy, te um, technocratic uh, vision that is economic at bottom. Um, doesn't, that phenomenon doesn't affect all countries uh, similarly, obviously. Um, there's this obvious tendency for the poorer countries, for the weaker countries to be affected uh, worse than the rich countries. It's never been cheaper for Germany to borrow money on financial markets and continue doing what it's been doing 
over the past decades uh, be a frugal economy. Um, but that is, basically that is um, the, 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 the onslaught of the economic, the invasion of the economic allows the Germans to be as what they are, what they, what they do best. But it's taking away that possibility from many of the other nations. Now again, there's a question of costs, um, the responsibility, um, the question of redress perhaps, at least at the moral level, at the European level, at the level of that credit that enables the European Union to function as it does and to be what it is for its citizens. Um, now at a little less abstract level, um, or possibly not, uh, the 20th century um, has always contained this dynamic in itself that it's, that it's allowed capitalism, in the free world at least, to turn citizens into consumers. People like Chomsky would argue that it's inherent to capitalism, that capitalism needs uh, consumers first of all and citizens second. Um, this now provides us with it, at least with, without discussing the inner merits of the Chomsky thesis, it provides us with a template to ask um, what, um, or where does direct popular commerce with the credit of an idea lead the whole thing? In other words, um, if we allow this economic rationality to take over, if we allow citizens to citizens of the European Union, citizens of Europe, to directly interact, to, 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 to trade, so to speak, with, with this credit. Um, what will that mean for that credit? If we look at uh, history, if we look at Protestantism, um, another occasion, uh, the rise of Protestantism, a Reformation, another occasion where um, something that was initially perhaps considered holy and sacred and outside the reach of, um, of um, the ordinary human being uh, is in a sense made more profane and accessible to that human being. Uh, part, of what, part of that process, an in inevitable part of that process, seems to be a certain disenchantment. The ideas lose their power. Um, a similar process now seems to be underway in Europe. At least, again, there seems to be no counter-movement, no counter-push, no reaction. Um, to buttress, to shore up the, um, the credit of the European idea. Um, an interesting aside here might be a look at Habermas, Jürgen Habermas and his theory of communicative rationality, which in a sense uh, assumes that, that, that individuals acting as individual units, single units, will inevitably build up a, a certain kind of rationality, uh, certain kinds of standards, uh, sort of recreate the whole thing from the bottom up. Again, I think recent years, the events over the um, past decade may, 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 may legitimately uh, cause us to ask whether that is a credible scenario. Very difficult to imagine uh, a spontaneous, a sp a spontaneous um, uh, um, resurgence, re-emergence of the European idea uh, at a time when governments obviously, uh, n none of the bigger governments obviously is interested in it and smaller governments um, either lack the uh, understanding or the desire or the means to push for a different logic, to push for a different, um, a wider sort of European debate on this. Um, this pessimistically, or to pessimists, this now may signify uh, what may be seen as the logical end of the European idea, uh, the disappearance of its inner tensions, the um, dominance of the economic, direct commerce, as it were, of European citizens as consumers, cons consumers with the idea of the European good, um, uh, the a certain disenchantment that seems to be inevitable, um, a certain privatised morality even, which tends to um, tends to um, or tends towards simplification, um, or allied with uh, structures or mechanisms such as a free and volatile public opinion, 
um, and um, uh, democratic decision making, uh, there's a natural tendency in all of this to crowd, to crowd out dissension, alternatives, tensions. If economy, if making ends meet is the only thing on most people's minds, then everything else must take uh, a back seat. Everything set up for this. The only thing that's kept it um, from taking the front seat, the economic so far, has been uh, the relative, the more well, arguable economic success of the European Union over the um, preceding decades. Now, inherent in all of this, in this process, is also a, a certain unavoidable loss of perspective um, for Europe. In a philosophical sense, the more we degrade the European idea, the more it degrades, the more it um, fragments, the, the, the more the credit, the European credit is consumed, the, 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 lower, the lower the vantage point for the European citizen or for anyone really wanting to um, generate some mobilization around the European idea, the, uh, the fragmentation carries in itself an automatic weakening of the structures that might counteract it. Uh, you can only, in a sense, look at this economic um, logic, the economic rationale, this discourse uh, at eye level. There's very difficult, with the credit slowly dissipating, there's very, it is very difficult to acquire a footing elevating one above that again. Um, that is the, I think, the real tragedy of the current events for the European idea. Um, in a sense, we have here what Nietzsche predicted in the 19th century, God is dead, or actually was stated in the 19th century. He said it about something else, he said it about Christianity, but um, as a kind of secularized Christianity, at least resting on similar assumptions, you could now say the same perhaps about Europe, the European Union. Um, in Europe today, God may be dying for the second time, for the last time perhaps. This of course is idle philosophical speculation uh, in more in more sort of um, immediate cogent terms what we have here uh, and what we must go by is obviously facts, European facts. And some of them we have already broached. We talked about Italy, um, Greece, what happens in Northern Europe. Um, We've charted the way in which direct popular commerce with the ideal European credit tends to devalue it. Um, the way ideas of commerce and credit themselves form a part of a wider discourse that's now become um, almost universal, the economic mindset, uh, which has invaded other discourses and crossed boundaries uh, from which uh, to, into other territories from which it's been separate. Uh, previously, uh, we've talked about how the political has lost out to the economic and through it how the democratic uh, and increasingly the ethical and the moral have lost out to the economic. Um, we uh, have talked about the fragmentation of um, Europe, the growing split between the us or inside us as Europeans and citizens of competing nation states with the former uh, winning out. Now much of the blame for this, I think, can be uh, laying on the door doorstep of Germany, Europe's largest nation, um, and perhaps coincidentally also the birthplace of Protestantism uh, and, related notion, and the related notion of austerity and efficiency. Um, European political practice has for decades rested on, the, on, on two assumptions, that best practices are born out of equal, even debate among um, European agents, member states, and that these best practices are cumulative, i.e. that they accrue as credit, um, that they have, uh, that, that, that these accumulations also have a certain automatic right, that they go in an automatically in a right direction, being best practices, they can hardly go anywhere else. But there is a certain teleology that whatever is created on the ground, the credit always points us to the future, towards the future. It sort of lights, lights up the way. 
Mm. Now, what we have seen over the past five years at least, and um, maybe even a little bit longer prior to the uh, Lisbon summit, a Lisbon treaty, the adoption of the Lisbon treaty, um, is that uh, what increasingly count, counts in European summits and uh, other lesser ministerial fora um, is two rather different things. Firstly, what counts is size of countries, which equals power, negotiating power, uh, decision-making power. And secondly, uh, as, I, as I've been saying, a certain economic stroke, technocratic orthodoxy, a certain eth economic technocratic mindset. Um, an increasing number of ideals has become um, unaffordable. Solidarity is acquiring a monetary value. Now the point here on a practical level is not to say that Germany should now turn around and bail out other European nations, um, forgive them their faults as it were. Um, to a degree, obviously it must because it is the only nation within the European Union in whose power it is to turn things around and there are certain things that need to be there for this crisis to go away for good um, and allow the European Union to continue roughly from where it left off. We need a banking union, um, we need a certain uh, safety net for ind indebted countries and for all of this Germany must or should make certain commitments. But even even conceding that this is a very, very difficult decision, a sovereign decision for German people, there are easier things Germany could do, um, on which though there seems to be no debate, no willingness to consider options within Germany uh, at the level of the German government. For example, Germany is currently running a trade surplus that is greater than that of uh, China's, or roughly equal to that of China's. Um, now this is a trade policy that um, many, uh, the Financial Times specifically, especially has described as a beggar thy neighbour approach. Um, Germany has for years relied uh, largely also on its European neighbours. Now, now that these have been beggared, Germany is pushing on them the same remedy but with the difference that these European neighbours, the southern European states, must now find their own neighbours, uh, new neighbours to beggar, because Germany would, is not willing and is not willing to take measures to divert any of its national wealth towards creating demand for the production of these southern countries who have um, submitted to the economic logic of austerity and efficiency and the rest of it over the past um, few years and who have now um, gone quite far in reforming their economies and also to degree their political systems along this essentially German model. Um, now all of this uh, takes place or sort of on um, uh, all of this takes place against the backdrop uh, of this pretty insidious but um, uh, ever-present or, 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 or almost um, universal assumption, a quiet assumption, that at some point the EU will return to business as usual um, and that business as usual can be somehow resumed when things and days improve specifically of course, the economies pick up again. However, now this is an assumption that I believe uh, is not only entirely untested, but is arguably simply wrong. I think it is more than reasonable to suppose that what goes on the what goes on in the EU today has been going on um, has been going on for the past five years, if not more, um, has laid the groundwork of a new order of things, of a new order of discourses, of a new order of priorities uh, has reshaped, has begun reshaping the EU in a way that I think cannot be undone simply by, uh, by some summit fiat. Um, 
The question I think we must ask now, the question that arises is who or what power and under what circumstances could conceivably turn around this dynamic, this consumption of the ideal of Europe, the consumption of this European credit we have built up over decades by, by this economic mindset, economic logic. Um, and we must ask, as I said, whether a return to the status ex ante is possible at all. Um, it raises the interesting question of uh, what precisely uh, would act as the conduit, as the bridge between what was there, be, say, at about 2009, and what might be there again once this crisis is over. Um, it seems to me that not, nothing's been left unaffected by the, um, by the processes I've been trying to describe, not, um, not people, not individuals, not uh, officials, not institutions, not governments. Um, I don't think that anybody, that there's anything or anybody unchanged carrying the same ideals and same ideas that um, guided European politics and practice um, up until the crisis. In a sense, uh, you could, a bit flippantly I suppose, say that uh, Europe uh, is splitting from the European Union, that these two are now parting ways, that what the EU does is, carries on, is, is, is carry on um, as if by habit. Uh, the outward show of EU business, there's the usual or even, um, or even greater proliferation of summits. Um, there are numerous, innumerable ministerial meetings. Mm. There's great activity, um, there's the um, concentration of EU decision-making apparatus in Brussels. Well, that's, that's been going on before the crisis, obviously. Um, the EU has a capital like never before. Um, but again, the question must be asked uh, whether Brussels is any longer the capital of Europe. Um, if we look at... Um, again, where decisions are made, if we look at concentrations of real European political power, I think we are today looking at Berlin and perhaps to a degree to Paris uh, and London and that's it. And Brussels uh, seems increasingly uh, an afterthought in this. So perhaps this assumption that the EU is coextensive with Europe um, has slowly become uh, a simple error. Um, a, a, a mistake, if it were to be, um, if it were to be made um, um, the basis of any further expectations or, or, or action. Um, borrowing from the Derrida again, um, we must also ask about Europe as a heading um, for others, not for itself. Um, the rest of the world, Europe's for decades now functioned as an ideal for many of the countries outside its borders. Um, it's been obviously conceived differently uh, in different cultures, by different countries, by differ different uh, um, nations and people, but it's always been a destination. Um, if we look at immigration, then I think it's an interesting question that arises here is whether this um, and this, well, this goes beyond immigration, obviously, whether, Europe, whether the European Union is still seen as um, um, as an objective um, that is not simply a place in the world that is better off, where people lead better lives um, than, say, those, in, those of poorer countries that, 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 that make the move to migrate. Um, whether there's anything else to draw them. Um, I think arguably in the past, dec past decade, for many of the post-Soviet nations, especially uh, on the territory of the former Soviet Union, Europe was, was, was something of a higher concept. Uh, it was a way of life that didn't, wasn't simply reducible to the economic. Uh, and so the question is, can we, can we still assume that? Uh, is Europe still able to provide 
that kind of um, that kind of uh, example uh, for the rest of the world. Um, what's become of Europe of, of this quintessentially European um, objective of promoting regional um, regional integration? It's an objective that goes back all the way to Immanuel Kant, who uh, predicted that there might or will be one day a world republic. Uh, the way he saw it is very much the way the European Union has seen it up until today. Um, regional collections of states uh, along the lines of the European Union will um, take over the world and negotiate a global settlement. Now, if the European Union has lost that drive and does not reacqu reacquire it, then what of the European vision uh, for the world? What of the rest of the world? What of the European Union itself? Uh, how would it cope as one among many regional players with no particular moral standing, um, uh, with no uniqueness, with no exclusivity in a sense. Um, if we draw a parallel with the United States of America, then what sustains that country's, that culture's uh, inner strength is, is a certain vision that doesn't necessarily require the rest of the world, but Europe's been built on, the idea of Europe's been built on the idea of diversity, increasing diversity and increasing unity, this almost paradoxical sounding um, liaison between two almost opposing concepts. Um, more specifically and more um, to the point, I think, we must ask what's to become of um, the Union's closer neighbours, the uh, objects of the neighbourhood policy, for example, uh, on the southern shores of the Mediterranean, I think the, the answer is becoming increasingly clear. The European Union is not able to shape the destiny of any of these countries. Um, it, is, it is, I think, um, showing itself even incapable of handling uh, some of the um, more elementary uh, aftershocks and after effects of, uh, of the events in Libya and, uh, and Egypt, um, notably immigration. If we look at what's occurred um, on the Mediterranean involving ships carrying migrants. But I think more pertinently to the European idea in its institutional uh, guise at least, uh, looking at um, the Eastern neighbourhood policy where clear, fairly clear institutional mechanisms have emerged to engage these countries, uh, specifically Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova. There's a summit coming up in Vilnius at the end of November where association agreements uh, might be signed or initialed by these countries. Um, we must ask if um, the European Union is in the future going to hold up its end of the bargain. Um, it seems to me that these country, the Eastern partners have gone into this bargain with clear expectations of Europe's, in a sense, moral superiority. And if that now gets lost in this economic crisis, then what, I wonder if um, that also means that Europe's, in a sense, the European Union uh, will find it, in a, in a sense, in a in a position where it will have forfeited the destinies of these countries uh, through no fault of their own? Um, these are diffi difficult questions, I think, but they need to be asked and they certainly will be asked by the uh, citizens and leaders of, um, of, of neighbouring countries. Now, um, I think the, the last bastion, as it were, in that battle with the economic, the creeping economic invasion is the sphere of EU law, autonomous EU law, as it has emerged over the past three decades. Now, that still remains separate, superior, uh, autonomous to that of the member states. Um, the institutional logic of the treaties up until the Lisbon Treaty has always seen EU law to be on the ascendant and there's no sign at this point 
that um, this practice could be reversed. Lisbon, as we know, gave um, um, the EU uh, judiciary, uh, ju judicial sphere, um, control over foreign policy, even traditionally, and still very much a matter of member state sovereignty, in um, two crucial respects when it concerns uh, or of issues that concern uh, existing EU legislation and issues that concern um, uh, EU citizens' rights. Now, as long as these tendencies uh, are not reversed, I think there is some hope to push back the onslaught of the economic. Um, but again, um, we, may, we may simply be looking at some institutional legal inertia, obviously time will tell. Time will also tell um, if um, the EU is a, a more resilient um, renewable resource as it may seem uh, to me at least today. Um, whether its credit does have any other sources or whether it's um, credit can be replenished even in the current climate uh, of crisis and the and then post crisis if other spheres can perhaps regain some of their autonomy um, now my own guess is that um, this credit is well on the way towards running out um, in a sense we're in a situation where once we've seen it once we've lost the credo in the credit once we no longer believe in it um, we cannot, as it were, reinitialize ourselves. We cannot bring back um, this trust, this almost unquestioning trust you would need to have to believe in the credit, to have it guide your life, to, have, to, to allow it to guide the European project. Um, if that happens, then um, all that is left of the word of Europe, at least for the foreseeable future, is a shell to be filled by whatever daily interests uh, they want to fill it, presumably national interests. It will be contested. It won't have its own uh, sovereign autonomous ground any longer to repel these sorts of attempts of uh, contesting it. Um, it will be occupied by other ideas, lesser, smaller ideas. Um, this certainly seems to be the ultimate destination, the ultimate um, endpoint of the present course. Um, um, whether that um, is what happens is obviously impossible to say um, at this point. Um, the question arises um, if that view, if my view, pessimistic view, were to be true, whether there is anything that could be that could take the place of this European credit, anything at all that might be um, consumed or might sort of provide uh, consumption, uh, might provide sustenance for something above uh, the brute, naked self-interest of nation states. Um, if not, then Europe will revert, uh, as I was saying, to just another territory, uh, just another region in the world. Um, contested by uh, centers of real sovereign um, state power. Um, at the very least, I think um, one thing is certain, there will be, there can be, no return to an earlier state, to a, say, pre-Lisbon or, or Lisbon Treaty era situation. This crisis is, 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 is not the passing phenomenon. It's already left uh, an indelible mark on the EU's institutions, on the way politics is made within the EU, on the way countries treat countries, on the way um, hierarchies of priorities, hierarchies of values work, um, on everything that really uh, the European Union is. So history may rhyme to a certain extent, but it certainly does not, will not repeat itself because it very much looks like it simply will not be able to. Thank you.